Hello, hello. Welcome back to Let's Talk Ray Bradbury. If you've not subscribed to our channel, please do. So here on Let's Talk Brad Ray Bradbury, we've been reading through the collection, The Stories of Ray Bradbury. For those who are reading along with me, we are up to story number 38 of 100 in the collection. Today's tale is called Hail and Farewell, Farewell from 1948. The way these videos work is I usually do a quick synopsis up front and then at the end of the video share a few thoughts and sort of impressions that I get from the story and sort of how you can apply it to your life or how it relates to my own. So um, for that synopsis, uh, upstairs in his bedroom, a boy, apparently 12 years old, is packing his bag and preparing for a trip. Only it is soon revealed that among his bags is a birth certificate of his uh, saying that he is in fact 43 years old. Downstairs, his parents, Anna and Steve, uh, the couple he's been living with the last few years, um, uh, they sort of greet him and they sort of implore that um, maybe he should stay with them a little longer. Uh, but he insists that he has to go because people in the neighborhood are beginning to talk about his lack of growth. On the walk uh, to the train station, um, he sees some boys playing ball, some boys who he used to play with, uh, play ball with uh, just a few years ago, but now they sort of outshoot him because as we are learning, Willie uh, has some sort of condition where he does not age and he in fact looks like a boy of 12 or less, although he's 43 years old. Uh, so over that ball, um, as he sort of picks it up to throw it back to them, he sort of reminisces about his life. Um, Decades ago, uh, he uh, he realized that he wasn't aging and he had trouble because no one would allow him to work for him um, doing a man's work. But also, uh, neither was he seen appropriately as a as a freak, um, a freak uh, to appear in the circus. Um, one circus uh, owner basically said um, people want to see midgets and are dwarfs and you look like a boy. Um, there's nothing grotesque about you. I can't employ you. Uh, so he sort of stumbled upon a job and that job is um, to him the job of being um, being the, the child that many couples long for but never have. And he does this in a f increments of a few years. Um, uh, he goes to new towns. He meets young, young couples. Um, they see him. They worry about him, wonder if he's an orphan, wonder where his parents are. They sort of take him in and then one thing leads to the next and he becomes sort of like their child. And um, the, the, this is, works fine and the parents are okay with it, but um, people in the community, um, as their own children age, um, sort of wonder at his lack of aging and they get um, a little bit worried and they sort of... Uh, uh, Project the fact that, okay, this is a grown man playing with my children. There's obviously something wrong with that. He can't be up to any good. And it's basically it creates sort of a Frankenstein's monster uh, type of situation. Uh, but at the end of the story, uh, the train that he's boarded um, has driven through the night. He pulls into a new town. He sort of um, stands at the station looking down over a town of 10,000 and sort of wonders at his next new beginning. Uh, absolutely beautiful story. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the Curious Case of Benjamin Button, as well as the more recent horror movie, The Orphan. Uh, but there's no horror at all in this story, perhaps, other than that. Just the, the, the brief hints that um, people outside of the homes that he enters um, may see him as being an oddity and possibly dangerous and weird. But the people that he uh, he lives with seem to be in on the um, the situation after a few years, and they um, they implore him to stay because um, they have had uh, such a good experience with him, um, basically being uh, being acting as their child. And I love that um, you know that there is no shock from these parents, and the parents aren't the issue. It is the outsiders and people who don't really understand the situation inside the homes that he occupies. Um, as in a, as a, um, a youngest child, um, in the family, I kind of find this, uh, quite relatable because I'm used to, um, even at age 39, um, being continually thought of by my older siblings as being, um, a kid really, um, being the, the baby in the family. And in fact, I, at 39, I live with my mother. Um, uh, we two of us lived together alone, sort of after escaping a bad, um, living situation with my with my father and 
you know, some people sort of look down on this arrangement as if there's something wrong with us and with me in particular. And it's really not, you know, it's a uh, it's a pretty good partnership where we, you know, we share responsibilities and um, things that uh, both of us would lack from not having the more typical um, sort of socially acceptable situation where, you know, uh, adult kids move out, start their own families and um, and wives, instead of becoming divorced, um, live happily ever after with their husbands until the end of the days. But uh, more people than you think are in these situations. Next door neighbor, um, guy's older than I am, probably by decades, and he lives with his 80 year old mother and, you know, um, somebody has to take care of mothers, you know, and sometimes uh, sons and daughters need more care um, from parents than uh, is typical of the situations where basically at 18 people are gone. Well, that's changing too, where um, because of economic situations, um, people more often live with parents until two years later. But uh, I think if you're living outside the United States, you may not understand this as much um, because I think that extended families and um, sort of different family types are sort of more traditional there. But um, we still have this weird um, thing in the U.S. where, um, you know, the American dream and it's become harder and harder to get. And um, but, you know, me, I'm pretty happy with the way things are. You know, I I, I know I'm missing things, um, aspects of life that many people my age have long since moved on to become part of. But, hey, um, it beats living on the streets, I guess, and beats living alone and in misery, right? <laughs> but, I, I, you know, I get a little bit of that from from this story, this idea of um, somebody sort of being um, looked at as an eternal child. Uh, this person, Willie, he tried to, to move on, to have the normal life, but... It just wasn't in the cards for him. And I think uh, that is extremely relatable. And it's probably more relatable to more people now than it was um, perhaps in 1948 when Hail and Farewell was written. So, all right, guys. Um, next up, we'll be looking at The Great Wide World Over There from 1952. That is story number 39, 39 of 100 in the stories of Ray Bradbury. So be sure to read up and uh, come back in a few days and we will discuss it together. So uh, thank you for tuning in and see you later.